We're going to be dealing with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's look at verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, that's almost like a priest, that's a minister. When he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain outcast, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was and he saw him and he had compassion. So he went to him bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn to take care of him. On the next day, when he parted, he took out two coins and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a good neighbor to him? The one who fell among thieves. And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said this, go and do likewise. (sighs) Father, it's my prayer that something that's said today, Lord God, would instruct us Lord God, to the end that we would do your will in this earth today, that we wouldn't be the one who pass by when we see the hurt of others who've been jacked. Lord God, but we'll be the ones that will get off our high horse and care for those that we see around us in need, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. We are in the second last week, part six of the parables of Jesus, and we're going to be dealing with this parable of the Good Samaritan, and the premise for today The main lesson for today is the business of the church is to offer the world both good news and good dues. Take out your notes, if you will, today. Your notes are in your, your, you don't have one of these. You have a bulletin, and your notes are in your bulletin. So please take out your notes. Let's do a little review before we get into the lesson. Our Our 2013 theme is we must be about our Father's business. And for those of you who are new, we have introduced to the congregation the fact that our Heavenly Father is a business entity. He's not a businessman because he's not a man, but, but he is in business, and his business, his company has a name. And what is that name? The Kingdom of God. All right. And if you could, if you guys could turn on the air in here. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to faint up here. I don't want to make a scene. <laughs> kind of hot in here. Y'all know y'all draw heat. <laughs> All right. The name of his business is the Kingdom of God. By the way, there are three major subsidiaries to the Kingdom of God. Okay, in case you didn't know. Okay, you have one subsidiary that is the host of heavenly angels. They are part of the kingdom of God. They're part of God's business. You have the nation of Israel, okay, and you have the body of Christ, which is the church. They all serve to give glory to God. The currency of the kingdom is what? Glory, Glory, okay, and glory is what? 
knowing God and making him known. The goal of the kingdom is increase, is growth. And the kingdom has competition. The competition is called what? The world. Okay, we are of we are in this world, but we are not of this world because the world is the competition. Okay, now how to maximize this growth group last two weeks. Come to church last two weeks. You're already here. You got one more week to go. Okay, you can come to church after growth groups, though, by by the way, you're you're allowed to still attend. Okay, attend your growth group. Um, Work through the growth group questions and walk it out. Our walk it out question is in conjunction with our um, Easter um, push, our Easter evangelism um, program, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later, okay? And then we define a parable. What is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. God uses common things to explain to us his deep spiritual truths. Now, We told you that most of these parables have a pre-parabolic situation. You have the parable itself, and sometimes you have post-parabolic teaching, okay? The situation here is that Jesus was was about his father's business, carrying out a training exercise with his disciples. You see, Jesus, I don't know if you knew this, he only ministered for three and a half years. Jesus knew that he only had three and a half years and he had certain specific goals that he had to accomplish within that very short time frame. This is what four things that Jesus had to do. He needed to teach and model the principles of the kingdom of God. He needed to show proof to Israel that he was their Messiah. That's why he did the signs, the miracles, and other things. He had to die on the cross for our sin, and all while he was doing that, he had to train the team of leaders that would carry out his father's business when he passed off the scene, okay? And what he was teaching them is about the kingdom of God. The church is primarily an advertising, educational, and life transformational company. That's what we do. You know, If you look at the world of business, the business world is divided into various sectors. You have the manufacturing sector, okay? You have the finance sector. You have, uh, um, what's some other sectors of business? You have the um, the IT sector, okay, that deals with um, computers and various things like that. We fit into the educational sector, but we have multi-jobs to do. We are, first of all, we are an advertisement and promotional agency, and we have one primary message to give to the world, and the message is called the gospel. Okay, say that with me, the gospel. Okay, the gospel is a specific Message. See, some of you came in here today, you thought that this whole Bible was the gospel. Or you may have thought that the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were the go- is the gospel. No, these were the gospels, okay? But the gospel is one specific message that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you could put that up for me. 1 Corinthians 15 says, I declare unto you the gospel of Jesus Christ, which I've, which I've explained to you, and, and we, got, we got it up? Okay. If you can't get it up, we got to turn. We got to actually turn in the Bible to 1 Corinthians. Okay. Paul says, this is the gospel. Okay. He says, first of all, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he, was, that he rose again on the third day for our sins, according to the Scripture. Turn to, look at verse 3. Okay? For I delivered unto you first that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the entire gospel message. Ten words, Christ died for 
our sins and rose again the third day or something like that. Okay, let's, let, let, let's say that together. Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day. That's the good news. That, that's, that, that's all you got to tell somebody to get saved. All you got to tell them is, hey, if you, if you place your faith in the fact that Jesus died for your sin, you can have eternal life. That is our message. We are an advertising agency. We are a promotional agency. The second thing the church is, we are freedom fighters. Okay, we are freedom. Say freedom fighters. Okay, we participate with God to free people from the devil's bondages and the associated pain that comes in it. You see, everybody in this world has been jacked by the devil. Okay, we've been robbed. We've been swindled. We've been hoodwinked. We've been bamboozled. Okay, we've been jacked and left for half dead. Okay, but we think that we're alive, okay? And there is associated pain that comes from following the adversary's advice about our lives, and we are all living with that pain, okay? Think about the pain you deal with. I'm not just talking about an an incident that happens to you, okay? I'm talking about the pain that you always live in. Okay, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking too close for some of you, okay? See, see, some of us carry around pain on an ongoing basis. Every time something good happens to you, there is something that flares up within your soul that will not allow for you to enjoy yourself because you think about that time that that person did that thing to you. I want you to know today, church, you've been jacked. Okay, and the one who has jacked you was not that person that molested you. Okay, it was not that person that criticized you. It was not those people that weren't there for you. See, the reason why those people did that is because they were jacked and they were just living up the jacked up life that they were given. And it came on you in that way. But your enemy is not that person. Your enemy is the one behind the scenes who causes all these things to be. And that is the devil. And our job as the church is to rescue people, to search out and rescue people through the gospel of Jesus Christ who have been jacked by the devil and to work healing, deliverance, and freedom into their lives. You see, when a Christian comes today, see, Christians get a bad rap probably because of our own fault. See, our job is not to criticize the world. Our job is to free the world. You see, so when people see us coming, they should not see a judge. They should see Abraham Lincoln. They should see Martin Luther King. See, someone who has emancipated a people out of what they're in into freedom in Christ. Not that we stand over people and judge them, but we do point out to them that that lifestyle issues causes their current pain, okay? And to get out of that lifestyle, you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, the emancipator. Amen. You can praise God about that. Okay, that, that, that's a good thing. Okay, that's the second role of the church. And the third role is that we are an educational entity. We teach people how to walk with God in a new and transformed way. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Can, can you get that? It says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now check out verse 2. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we are in the business of life transformation. God is changing not only what you do, but he's changing how you think and feel. 
about life through transformation that comes from worship, that comes from fellowship, that comes from the study of God's word, that comes from giving, that comes from prayer, that comes from outreach, that comes from serving the Lord. Now, as we get to Luke chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus, look, look, let's just read it together. It says, after these things, now what are these things that Jesus is talking about? Jesus just got finished sending out his 12 disciples to various cities to evangelize them, okay? They came back. Now, after these things, look, it says, Jesus appointed 70 other also, okay, and sent them out two by two before his face. What does it mean before his face? Before he went to the city, okay, he sent out two representatives to every city that he was about to come to saying, Jesus is on his way. They were the promo. They were the advertisement. Jesus was about to have a crusade in their town, and they were going out ahead of, before Jesus, preaching the gospel to them so that they would be ready when Jesus came. And by the way, that's what the church still do, does today. Okay? And you know what our message is? Jesus died for your sins, but guess what? He's coming back to a town near you. Okay? See, Jesus just didn't die on the cross. He wasn't just raised from the dead, but he was also seated at the right hand of the Father and was given a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, but that's not all. He's coming back again to get his own, and, and, and you want to be one of his own. Okay, we are an ad agency. We are a promotional agency. So he sent out these 70 guys into about 35 cities before Jesus came. And he said to them, hey, the harvest, this is for us today, is truly great, but the laborers are few. See, in other words, there were multitudes that followed Jesus. He could only find 70 that he could send out. That don't happen today, does it? By, by the way, by the time Jesus died, he only had about 300 disciples. These were 70 of them. He had the 12, he had the 70, and then he had the 300, okay? And that's how the church started. Those 300 people turned the world upside down. But he was, but he was training them here. Okay, he sent them out on a mission. He gave them an assignment to go reach somebody. He told them to go out and hand out some invitations. Does that sound familiar? Okay, he says, go your way. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Verse 4. Hey, neither carry money, bag, knapsack, or sandals. Greet nobody on the road. What he's saying is, hey, I'll take care of you. I'll resource you when I send you, okay? I'll make sure you're taken care of, okay? And greet nobody on the road. Don't get distracted, okay? When you go into somebody's house, say peace into this house. And if somebody peaceful is there, your peace will rest on it. If they do not have peace back to you, then it will return to you. You know, you say, um, never mind. Okay? And, and, and remain in the same house so they know where to find you. Okay? Eat and drink whatever's in front of you. Okay? They prepare a lavish meal. Don't say, oh, this is too much. Eat it because a workman is worthy of his hire. Okay? Whenever you enter into a city, if they receive you, eat the things that are set before you, heal the sick there, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you, but whatever city does not receive you, you shake the dust off your feet, okay, and, and, and um, it'll be more better for them. I know that's not good English. It'll be better for them than for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day, and you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were destroyed, 
Okay, so the 70 went out. They only went out for a short period of time. They came back to Jesus and they celebrated. They said, Jesus, verse 17, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus, man, he was just shouting with him. He was praising him. He said, yeah. He said, listen, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. He said, yeah, yeah, I, I'm the one that cast him out of heaven. You can cast him out of people. By the way, don't be scared of the devil. Okay, L- listen, don't be, and this is, this is, this is biblical, and, and I'm not going to take you all the way there to the passages. Don't be disrespectful. You know, don't call the devil names. Nothing like that, okay? But we have the authority, okay, to cast out demonic influence wherever we are, okay? Jesus cast him out of heaven. We can cast him out of our workplace. We can cast him out of our schools, Okay, we can cast him out of our church. Okay, we can cast them out of our homes. Okay, listen, if you know that it's the devil that's doing something, in other words, when there is no other earthly explanation of what just happened, okay, you need to, that, that's the devil and you need to cast him out of that scenario. In other words, you, you, you're in the house with your wife, okay, you're having a good time. And all of a sudden, you get into the biggest fight over nothing that you ever can imagine. And you're thinking to yourself, how in the world did this happen? Guess, guess what happened? Uh, um, um, devil just got into your mix. Okay? And he caused that situation to happen. And you need to stop, pray, cast them out. And you know what else Jesus says? This is what he says. He says, go to the next verse. He says, don't rejoice. Okay, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in in heaven. In other words, this is just part of your compensation package. Okay, you are members of the kingdom of God. And as members of the kingdom of God, you have authority, you have privilege, you have positions, you have a lot of things beside just that. That was spectacular. But you have so many more things going for you because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Then, while they were in the middle of rejoicing and and, and having a debriefing about what happened to all of them in their travels, it says, verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Understand, it says, look, he was testing Jesus, okay? You don't test Jesus, okay? So he came with the wrong attitude and the wrong intentions, okay? And he asked a question. And so Jesus gave him an answer that he could not possibly obtain. And you can't either. Look at what's going on. He said to him, what's written in the law? You're a lawyer. He wasn't a lawyer like we have today. He was an expert in the Jewish law, in the law of Moses, in in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay? And he, he answered him and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. See, he quoted Deuteronomy 6 that we dealt with earlier in in the baby dedication, okay? And love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law is is, is fulfilled in that statement. Yeah, just do that, okay? There's a problem with that for you and me. The problem is we can't do that. Okay, we don't do that because we love us. Love is mutually exclusive. You can't love yourself and love your neighbor because it's going to come a time when it's going, it's going to come between you and your neighbor and you, you're going to need to yield to your neighbor in love, which means they win and you lose. Okay, what love means is God wins, you lose. Okay, that is not in your nature. Somebody say, that ain't me. (laughs) 
And that's what the lawyer said. That's not me. So, so he says, one to just, look at verse 29. One to justify himself, he said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? That, that's how we, we rationalize. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? My next door neighbor? You see, because if you can narrow it down, it becomes easier to do. Who's my neighbor? The one I like, hey, I like the dude next door. I'll let him win. The, Jesus answered him with this parable, and we read it. A certain man went down to Jericho, got robbed, got stripped, got beat, got left unconscious on the side of the road. So here you have a naked man bruised, bloody, and beaten, unconscious on the side of the road. A priest walks by, sees a man like that, and crosses to the other side of the street. Sees a man in the image of God, bloody, beaten, naked, on the side of the road looks at him and crosses the street and walks on the other side. This is a man who was paid to take care of people. Levites, same thing. Paid to take care of people. Levites did not have, they didn't own land. They didn't have to own land. The people took care of them just like you take care of me in order to take care of people. They shirked their duty, walked on the other side of the road. Now, what you need to understand is a Samaritan was a person that while Israel was in bondage, they married and had babies with people who were not Jews, okay? And when they came back into the land after the captivity, those people who had married and had children with the other nations, they were put aside and put into a city called Samaria and were not allowed to intermingle with the rest of the, the Israelites because they were considered defiled by the pagans. And they weren't allowed to talk to them. They weren't allowed to interact with them. They treated them like dirt, okay? So Jesus says, who's the worst person I can think about walking by this man? A Samaritan walked by the man, got up off his horse, took care of the man, applied first aid to him, put him up on his own horse, and walked him to an inn where he could be taken care of, and, and he left money there for his future care. Okay, and then he asked the man who was the good neighbor. Okay, and, and the man says, hey, it was the Samaritan that was, as much as I hate to admit it, the Samaritan was the good neighbor. He told the man to go and do likewise. See, a violent robbery leaves a man in a struggle for life and death. You see, and everybody is in a struggle for life and death in this world. Everybody has had stuff stolen from them. Everybody's walking around spiritually naked on the side of the road, half dead, not fit to be in the presence of God. We are, we are half dead, busted, disgusted, and need to be rescued. Now, once we are rescued, we are then placed on a tactical mission to rescue as many other people who have been jacked. See, once you've been robbed, you ought to have some sympathy for somebody else who's been burglarized. You see, if your home has been invaded by thugs, you should have mercy upon other people who are in the midst of home invasion. Okay, and, and there are homes all around us. We have been rescued. 
Okay, Jesus has busted into our lives and have run off those that, would, that, 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 that wanted to invade our lives and our home. Now he sends us on a mission to rescue other people. You see, m- m- one of my favorite shows as I'm growing up, and I don't know this is, if anybody remembers this show, but it was one of my favorite shows on TV as a teenager. It was a show called SWAT. You remember SWAT? Okay. You remember SWAT? SWAT was called, you know, it was, you know, you were SWAT. Okay. So, so you had SWAT. You remember what SWAT stood for? Special Weapons and tactics, okay? And it, there's a branch in every police department that has this special group of officers who are specially trained in weapons and tactics. And their job is to, when there is a home invasion situation, when there is a hostage situation, when there is a major drug bust that needs to happen and they need to break into the dope house, Okay, and, and, and come against armed assailants who have a tactical advantage over them. In other words, when you go to bust a drug house, the, 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 the people in the drug dope house know that you, where you are, but you don't know where they are. So they have to be specially trained in order to break down a door and go into a house and make sure everybody's on the ground while they make the bust, okay? It's a SWAT team. Say SWAT team. team. Guess what? You're God's SWAT team. See, it is our job. See, God gives sometimes a special opportunity. He shows you people that are laying down, that need to be rescued. You know they need to be rescued. Our first inclination is to judge. We need to put the judgment aside and we need to put on our SWAT gear. Okay, and you know what? The Bible says we have SWAT gear. You know, you want to see? Okay, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. See, y'all thought I was just making this up. Okay, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 13. Let's let's, let's go all the way back. See, in in, in 2 Corinthians, he says, the weapons of our warfare is not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In Ephesians 6.10, it says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the the, the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand. You see, in order... To carry out our tactical mission, we must prepare five things. First thing we need to do is prepare our hearts and souls to have the will to help somebody. You see, you see, that's the first thing we have to prepare. See, in order to be on the SWAT team, you got to want to be on the SWAT team. You see, you have to want to rescue. You have to be built in a particular way so that breaking down doors and, and going in with, 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 with weapons and, and throwing in hand grenades and flash grenades, that got to be the kind of thing that's really cool to you. And you have to have your mind prepared to be able to be on a team like that. Most of our minds are not prepared for that, but God wants us to prepare our minds and souls for the tactical warfare that is ahead of us. That man's mind was already prepared, okay? See, if you go and help somebody like that man help the man that was laying on the side of the road, okay, your mind has to already be made up that if I run into this situation, I'm going to help somebody. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't, make up your, you can't make up your mind, okay, 
right there on the road. See, you, you're going to find an excuse why not to help that man. See, helping that man on the side of the road is inconvenient. It is expensive. You don't have the time to help nobody. You, 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 you see, if you're normal, like me, okay, you don't have time to help people. You're busy. You're going somewhere. So you have to prepare your mind to want to help somebody, first of all. You see, do you have the mind to help somebody? Okay, that if you see somebody that needs to be rescued, is your mind prepared? The second thing you have to prepare is you have to prepare your bodies to have the strength to help somebody. You see, if a man is laying down there half dead, you got to have enough strength to pick up a 150-pound man. That's how much people weighed back then. That was a big guy back in those days. They didn't have much to eat. Okay, back in those days. And, and so a 150-pound man was huge for their time. And to pick him up and to put him up on your horse, you have to be physically able to be able to do that. We need, we need to be, have our bodies in shape enough to be able to help somebody. What do I mean today? Now, we don't have to pick nobody up today, but see, some of us can't serve God because we're too tired. See, it's because we, we, we haven't got enough sleep. And we haven't got enough sleep because we stayed up all night watching TV or, or on the Internet or whatever, and we need enough strength to be able to help somebody. See, listen, if you're half tired, okay, you're only going to do what you have to do. See, you're only going to go to work, okay, and you're only going to take your kids to soccer practice. Okay, and that, that's, that's about it. You see somebody else that needs the help. Hey, they on their own because I'm tired. <laughs> we got to go to bed at night. Okay, we, we got we to eat something good. You see, like I said, if you're if you going to eat all the cookies and everything, at least, you know, eat, eat some kind of vegetables too so that you can have the right type of energy and strength that you need to do it. You know, and, and, you know, and, it, and it might not, you know, Sonny told me on the way to work, he said, you know, we, we, was, we was in the gym for a minute, man, we just, we missed two weeks. We got to be in the gym tomorrow. We got to get 30 days straight. See, we got to have the strength that we need in order to do the ministry that God has called us to do. Somebody needs to say amen. Okay, N next thing you need to have is not only you have to have the mind, not only you have to have the, the body, but you need to have, see, you need to prepare your schedule to have time to help somebody. Okay, what I'm saying to you is this. See, you can't just all, you can't, you can't live your life just being on time. Okay, and this is for somebody today. Okay, see, some of you guys are always late. Okay, you need to not ever be late. It needs to be a rare thing when you're late. Not only do you not need to be late, you need to be early. You know why? Because God can't use you if you just got enough time to get where you're going. You need to have a little time so that you're not so rushed. And this will also help with your speeding tickets. Okay, see, see, I don't, I don't speed as much anymore, okay, because I'm usually ahead of time, okay, so I don't have to go fast most of the time, okay, because I leave out usually way enough time, because something, God can put an opportunity for you to serve him on the way, but if you have just enough time to get to your obligation, you can't serve God. Okay, but if you have enough time, God is going to put opportunity in your way. And not only are you going to do good at your appointment, but you're going to get extra beside that because God can use you because you had enough space to actually look around and see people while you're headed to where you're heading. Do you notice how you are when you're rushing? You don't look at nobody. You don't speak to nobody. Don't say nothing to me. Hey, hey, hi, hi. How you doing? Hi, hi, hi. You, you, you don't have time. You know, and you look at it, and while you're saying hi, you say, don't say nothing else to me. Don't ask me how I'm doing. Because you're in a rush. You have to prepare. You have to, you have to manage your time. 
Not only do you have to, to manage your, your heart and soul and your body and your time, you have to manage your brain. See, this man knew how to help somebody. Did, did you see that? He said the man got off, got off his horse. First thing he did, he had bandages. He had oil and wine. They didn't have alcohol and stuff like that. They didn't have rubbing alcohol. It hadn't been invented yet. Okay, they didn't have they didn't have um, band aids. They didn't have um, um, all the stuff that we use today. But what they had was they had alcohol that would purify a wound. Okay, and they had oil that would soothe the wound. Okay, and by the way, when you're dealing with somebody that's been jacked, you have to use both. Okay, see the blood of Jesus purifies. Okay, but the oil of the Spirit soothes. Do, do, do you, un, you understand what I'm saying? You see, the, you have to sometimes tell people that, hey, this is wrong in order to help them. Do, do you understand that, that um, 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 we, we did a construction project on this very room? If you would have saw this room when we got it, okay, you would be amazed at how this place, the whole building, Okay, look like you look at when you first came in here, you, you look and say, say, uh, uh, um, Pastor, why did you buy this? <laughs> you see, but you have to understand, see, people are work in construction. And before you can remodel, you have to do some demolition. All right. All right. You see, that's part of the transformation process. See, you can't put up paint on a wall that has not been scraped. Do do, do you understand that? You see, you can't put something over mold because the mold is just going to seep through the wall that you put up. Do you understand? You can't, if the foundation is cracked, you have to repair it before you put up anything else. It will look good for a minute and then cracks will be everywhere. Demolition comes before construction. Do you understand? So, so you have to purify things first, okay? You might have to break down and tear down, and then you come right back with the healing oil. You put up the paint. You put up the carpet. You put up the pretty stuff, all, all that type of stuff. Both things have got to be done, and you have to have enough knowledge to understand, okay, the, in, in order to do things, which means that you have to, you have to watch something else, Besides the housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> All right. All right. You see, because that's not going to teach you how to do nothing. Amen. Amen. Nathan. Okay. What, what are we filling our heads with? Is it something that's going to help somebody? That's not to say never watch it. Okay, but you need to be filling your head with some, something that's going to help you and somebody else. So you have to prepare your heart and soul. You have to prepare your body. You have to prepare your schedule. You have to prepare your mind. Okay, and, and you got to prepare your money. You got to prepare your money. Okay, listen. You have enough. If you got a job, you got enough money. Okay, I'm I'm going to teach you one thing about money. If you're making over fifteen hundred dollars, I'm going to raise it up. I'm going to be nice. If you're making over eighteen hundred dollars a month take home, you got enough. Now, let me say this. You have enough to put some of that money aside and not spend it. A little bit, okay, even if it's only 20 bucks, okay, that, that you're not touching, okay? Now, some of you are saying, well, now, Pastor, I make 10 times that much, and, and I don't hardly have enough, okay? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You've got to train yourself, and this is what I'm learning. I'm learning. I've I got to train myself that to, to, in order to be used of God, I can't spend all that I have. You can't eat your seed corn. Right. All right. All right. You, you, you've got to have you've got to have something that you are planting for the for the future that you're not eating. 
okay? That is a biblical principle, okay? Believers shouldn't be broke. Okay, you need to have $20 somewhere that you're not touching. Okay, so you, you got to have something that an emergency comes up. Okay, you, you, you got you to have something put it aside. At least 10% of what you make, okay? You got to pay the Lord and you got to pay yourself and then you live off the other whatever, okay? You used to live off of it anyway. You used to live off of it. I'm talking about anybody of any age, okay? You remember when you made, you see, I, I remember when I, when I made like my, my first job, I, I made three thirty-five an hour. Three thirty-five. I'm talking three thirty-five. <laughs> you see, and I worked so hard, and I, I was good at what I do, and I asked, I asked for a raise. <laughs> Okay, but I worked hard frying that chicken. I was KFC down, man. I, I was the best chicken cook in the world. Okay, master chicken cook. Pow, pow, pow. You know, I was, I was, I was on the chicken. Okay, and so, and so I got up to four dollars. Okay, then four twenty-five. Okay, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I couldn't imagine. Okay, I, I had friends. I had friends that made $500 a week. Couldn't imagine making that much money. Okay, couldn't even imagine. That, that's $2,000 a month. Now I can't imagine, <laughs> you know, what, you, you know what I'm saying? You know, now, and, and I know it's inflation and all that, you know, it was, it was some of that. But, you, but what, what I'm saying to you is we're in America, y'all, okay? We need to fix our gauges. See, the problem is your gauge. Okay, you have enough, you don't set your gauge on what you see what somebody else has. Because that's what's messing us up. You see, one other thing about the money, okay, this may be obvious to many of you, okay, for some, some dumb folks like me, it's, it's a hard lesson. You can't have any, you can't have money and spend your, all your money. You can't have it and spend it. Okay, you didn't catch that. I'm going to give you three seconds to soak in. Three seconds. You can't have money and spend money, so you need to make a decision. Do I want to have money? Okay? If you want to have it, you can't spend it all. Because once you spend it, guess what? You don't have it anymore. Okay? And it doesn't happen by magic. Okay, it, it, it happens by not spending it this month and not spending it the next month and not spending this money this year. Okay, and, and, and the money over time builds up. So now somebody else is in trouble. Okay, that money that you have and you've set aside. Okay, you, you got money set aside in your pocket. You got money set aside in the bank. You got money set aside in the 401. You got money set aside all over the place now, okay? And so, hey, now you can help somebody else. See, it's because you were prepared. Listen, last thing, I'm closing. Nobody walks into the dope house, okay, without proper preparation and without pr proper training. Okay, you don't walk into the, see, because cause the dope man, okay, is not going to let you just take his dope. Okay, you come in there with, 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 with guns, okay, the, the, the criminal is going to want to shoot back. Okay, you've got to be prepared, okay, so prepare your soul and your mind, your spirit to want to help. Okay, prepare your body to be ready to help. And then we, it, prepare uh, um, um, prepare, what else you got to prepare? Yes, prepare your schedule. And what else? Your money. And what else? There's one more thing. And, 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 yeah, yeah. And, and your mind so that you know what to do when you get in there. And then the next thing you have to do is what Jesus says, go do it. I wake up every morning, okay, knowing that I'm on God's tactical team. I know that at some point in the day, somebody's going to need for me to rescue them, okay? It's not because I'm different than you. 
Okay, it's because it's because God has prepared me in these ways to help somebody else. And he's training his church to be about his father's business. And people on the side of the road is his father's business. Okay, we got a training now.